Understanding creation, what does the fossil record tell us? Um, uh, we've been discussing the book Understanding Creation for the last uh, uh, about 12 weeks now, plus. Um, it's uh, edited by James Gibson and Umberto Rossi. And uh, there are 20 chapters uh, which are uh, given as questions one might ask. Apparently questions that are kind of a frequently asked question kind of uh, arrangement. And each question is intended to be standalone, although as we'll find out today, uh, they uh, sometimes relate to each other. Uh, they were originally intended to be 1,800 to 2,400 words. Um, uh, this week uh, we're discussing What Does the Fossil Record Tell Us by Roberto Biaghi. Uh, and um, for those of you who don't know him, Roberto Biaghi completed a science teaching degree in Argentina and then came to Walla Walla University where he got an MS and uh, he got an MS in geology at La Sierra University. Um, he holds a PhD from here with an emphasis in paleontology. He's taught natural sciences mostly in the uh, uh, South American area, uh, some in Mexico. Uh, as you might guess, his native language is Spanish. Um, <coughs> he's uh, had various research projects which have led to earth science publications and presentations at many science meetings. And he's currently teaching natural sciences and philosophy of science and religion at Universidad Adventista del Plato, where he also directs the South American branch of the Geoscience Research Institute and contributes to that institute's publication in Spanish, Ciencia de los Orígenes. <coughs> uh, my own comments as we get into it, I, uh, uh, from reading the chapter, Roberto Biaghi, he makes a number of statements on what the fossil record is not. Some of them aimed at evolutionists, but most of them aimed at creationists. So uh, this is kind of one of those uh, what uh, Answers in Genesis put up as arguments creationists should not use. And I think that there are still a number of creationists that uh, particularly um, that still use some of them. He then draws from a number of diverse evidences that are compatible with the biblical account and pose difficulties for standard evolutionary theory, um, which is most of what he says. Uh, his notes are quite helpful in backing up the assertions he makes. And um, I noted as I read it and typed it <coughs> that... Uh, he appears to have overrun his allotted 2,400 words. By my count, he was 2,556, which uh, that doesn't count the references. Although, uh, in his case, I'm glad that uh, uh, he did overrun it because I think that his, uh, his uh, comments are well worth the extra verbiage. He starts out by saying the fossil record is an archive showing the history of life on Earth. It includes related data, for example, the nature of the rock layers in which it is found. Researchers have developed an impressively large database, and he gives a database, and part of it's on the web. I didn't write the entire um, website, but it's, it's in the book. Um, combining, uh, containing not only raw data, but also interpretations uh, about the remains, rocks, processes, time involved, and the supposed ecology of those organisms. It is important to keep in mind that the database contains both objective data and interpretations of it. Um, and then, you know, you always ask, well, how well is known is the fossil record? Is it complete? Is it complete enough for what we want to do with it? And uh, recent studies tried to address that. has shown that when the fossil collectors curves, and maybe I should explain... Uh, what a collector's curve is. It's a graph of the rate of discovery of new fossil types as more fossil specimens are collected. The line continues to rise as long as new types are discovered and then levels off when essentially all types have been found. In a way, you can think of it as a large bag of M&Ms 
and you reach in and you grab the first one, it's going to be a new color, regardless. Well, the second one may be the same color, maybe another color. Well, after you get, I don't know, five or six colors probably from, for M&Ms, uh, you level off, you don't get any more. Uh, well, you can imagine that you've got maybe 100 different fossil types, but you don't know exactly how many there are. Well, after you've taken several thousand samples, you can be pretty comfortable that you've got most of those types. So if you plot the specimen found versus the kind of animal that is being found, um, then you have a collector's curve. Now, to be fair, you could be thrown off because you could have a fossil of something that you don't even recognize as an animal or plant. Um, and if that's so, why uh, collecting more fossils won't help you. You really need uh, help in understanding what you're looking at. But assuming that you can identify previously living from not previously living material, um, uh, there should be a statistical match that will tell you that you're something like, say, 90% complete, in which case you can use that data with some confidence. So when the fossil collector's curves are analyzed, the number of fossil vertebrates and invertebrate families described during the past 200 years show a continuous increase to no more than 3,000 families at present, and it's starting to level off. On the other hand, the number of, that's my typo, families with both fossil and living representatives is leveled off at about 1,600 families. This suggests that the uh, global Phanerozoic, that is a current geological era record of fossil metazoans, is still fairly incomplete. However, it is believed that the known record is quite representative, and I think that he's probably fairly accurate on that. Now, you're going to see a lot of this parenthetical stuff because He's going to use a lot of big words, and I'm sure that um, if he didn't recognize them, the editors, in particular Umberto Rossi, would have recognized, wait a minute, the average person has no clue as to what this is. So he'll be explaining a lot, sometimes in parentheses like this, sometimes as commas or dashes, sometimes as, uh, as notes, as you, know, you see in, in three. Um, when considering the available data, great care should be taken in making interpretations and constructing arguments to support our views. In the next section, he's going to discuss this great care that we need to take. Uh, we discuss some widely uh, held views that are not supported by the data. So this is kind of arguments you shouldn't make, dispelling er erroneous conceptions. As Christian scientists and students, we need to be on the lookout for bad science. Not just in the other guys, but in ourselves. Claims that are unsupported by either data or the scriptures. Example of erroneous ideas that have been promoted by some creationists are listed below. Misconception one, the geologic or stratigraphic re column is not real, but is a human construct intended to mislead us. This goes all the way back to George McCready Price, and it's understandable why he started it. Because in the area that he studied in particular, there were uh, some confusions about the, uh, the layers. But as time has gone on, people have examined the rocks in more areas. It has become evident that those are, in fact, exceptions rather than the rule. We noted earlier that the record is real, the data are real, and in spite of our problems with some interpretations, the overall stratigraphic sequence is real. Problems arise from differences in interpretation regarding the origin of the observed sequence or the nature of the processes that produce the sequence. How could there be order, some asked, if everything resulted from a major catastrophe, such as a global flood? However, experience in the field consistently shows that order is present in the fossil record. You make drill holes, you're going to find certain kinds of organisms in those drill holes. And they will help you to find where there is oil, for example. People bet a lot of money on that. And it's, they wouldn't keep betting if they didn't start winning some of the time. Um, 
How could there be order, some asked, if everything resulted from a major catastrophe such as a global flood? However, experience in the field consistently shows that order is present in the fossil record. This very consistency in the ordered sequence is the reason for the success of various geological e exploration technologies that are used in the exploitation of mineral and fossil resources. Um, and I would just say that, the, that if we're creating a creationist model, we have to accept that the stratigraphic record is at least r fairly well represented by a sequence. What does the uh, misconception number two, the fossil reconstructions are full of errors. This is again one that was understandable at one time. In the first years of paleontology as a science, many errors were committed as, an orga as organisms were reconstructed based on very few fossil bones, or when parts that had been discovered were assigned to a particular organism. He's talking about what used to be Brontosaurus is now Patasaurus, but he's also talking about Nebraska man, which is reconstructed from a pig's tooth. To be fair, there's probably two things going on there. One of them is minimal data, but the other one is somebody's over-enthusiastic um, theological interpretation. Or maybe one should say anti-theological interpretation. However, today's reconstructions have become quite accurate due to the development of various subspecialties and the discovery of vast numbers of remains on all continents, including whole specimens now that might be missing one or two bones rather than one or two bones instead of the whole specimen. Misconception three, dinosaurs are not real. Today, nearly everyone recognizes that dinosaurs really existed and his reference uh, that is a uh, number of things by Esperante, including one in Minister Magazine, and the chapter that we'll be discussing next week. Paleontologists as well as dinosaur enthusiasts have found thousands of dinosaur fossils including eggs and embryos and recently organic molecules such as a protein, collagen, and what appears to be well-preserved blood and bone cells and bo blood vessels. And that's one of the disadvantages of using that kind of argument is then you can't use the other argument which I think is more powerful. Dinosaurs existed and they didn't exist that long ago because we still have uh, material from them that uh, should have disappeared in 65 million years. Misconception four, there are human footprints alongside those of dinosaurs. Now, there may be, but the ones that have been examined don't fit. They're frauds. This notion became very popular. In some places, it remains so, because if you can find Barney and Fred, then the game is over. Based on claims of such a discovery in the bedrock at Polixia River, Texas, what is not well known is that Seventh-day Adventist creation scientists, and I believe Art Chadwick and who was the other person that was? Bernie Newfeld. Bernie Newfeld. Um, were instrument, the main ones instrumental in, in testing the uh, hypothesis. And they put the evidence to the test and discovered the fraudulent nature of the human track claims. Dinosaur tracks are there, for sure. Human tracks been made by local carvers. Uh, one must be wary of claims publicized as proofs that are necessary to sustain our beliefs. Misconception five, the entire fossil record or geologic column was laid down during the one year of the biblical flood. Some may have envisioned the formation of the geologic column as a result of a single catastrophic event, but we now know that the record is more complex than a single event could produce. Uh, based on the data, a reasonable scenario suggests that parts of the lower portion of the record, particularly the Precambrian, and then it's not clear how far up you go, although most people would say the eh, Cambrian pretty much starts the flood. Um, Uh, part of the lower portion of the record consists of pre-flood rocks that were not completely altered or eroded away by the catastrophe. In the same way, an upper part of the section most likely represents the strata and processes that occurred after the flood. And certainly the Pleistocene, right now we're debating as to how far back you can go 
whether perhaps Eocene or even Paleocene uh, is uh, part of the post-flood record. Um, in this way, a significant part of geologic activity would be represented in the pre-flood and post-flood rocks. Misconception six, marine fossils high in the mountains as proof that flood, the floodwaters covered the highest peaks and therefore the whole earth. It's kind of true, but not really. Those fossils were not strewn around the mountain peaks as the water covered them but were produced when organisms died in a body of water or were washed in and then were covered with layers of sediment. Later, those layers were uplifted during mountain forming processes. The fossils or the sediments that buried them could, not, uh, could have been a direct result of the flood or, the con or a consequence of flood related events. So for example, on uh, the Himalayas, including Mount Everest, tallest mountain on earth, there are fossils there. Those were formed low and then uplifted Mount Everest did not start at 29,000 feet and the flood washed over it. Misconception seven, the fossil record proves evolution or proves the biblical flood. We like certainty, the knowledge that we have the right answers or beliefs. Unfortunately, science, because of its methods and limitations, does not provide ultimate truth, as scientists have learned to their chagrin. We thought we had it right with Newton, and then we found out we didn't. We had it mostly right, but there are, are enough exceptions that we know Newton wasn't exactly right. And now we're having the same kind of crisis with Einstein. Uh, quantum mechanics seems to be weathering the storm, but quantum mechanics seems to require uh, stuff that um, shouldn't be possible. It has no mechanical foundation. Um, and science is uncomfortable with things that are mathematical but not mechanical. They come too close to miracle. So science, and, and particularly in physics, has had to live with this uncertainty. Um, And especially this is true regarding theories such as evolution or creation, which have a metaphysical component. What science can do is provide evidence for aspects of evolutionary theory, such as the ways in which similar organisms are adapted for different environments or for catastrophic processes that led to the extinction of some life forms. So we can get evidence, but we're not going to get an absolute proof. So then he moves into the next section, which is, takes up most of what he has to say from here on out. Evidence consistent with a short age geological model that considers data from the biblical record. And uh, his, there's an article uh, that he cites, a brand, uh, actually a book, Brand with uh, Jarnus. Um, and uh, he says, we'll now consider some of the arguments that earth scientists have proposed in attempting to de develop a degree of harmony between the biblical record and the scientific evidence. And he cites, oh my, I, that's a typo there, Brand, Coffin, Brown, and Gibson, Ritland, interestingly enough, and the two books by Ariel Roth, those are uh, Origins and uh, Science Discovers God. Keep in mind, he says, that when we refer to the biblical record or creation week and the worldwide flood, we're referring to the traditional Seventh-day Adventist interpretation of the events recorded there. That is short age. Um, on the other hand, the evolutionary view implies a materialistic, uh, atheistic explanation of history. And I guess that means that from his perspective, the uh, idea of theistic evolution really doesn't... Uh, a merit uh, serious discussion, which is kind of interesting. Uh, at present, we still experience serious problems with some unresolved questions. So he doesn't have all of the answers. First, we don't yet have a satisfactory overarching detailed model for the development of the geologic column and its fossil record. 
Um, hypotheses have been proposed, for example, try to fit all the geologic column in the year of the flood or an extended flood model, but each one has numerous problems and raises more questions than it answers. Nevertheless, some attempts have been made, and he's citing Brand, and this remains an area of active research. So he says we don't have an answer yet, although there's some interesting leads and uh, people are working on it. Secondly, some major features of the fossil record are difficult to interpret within a short time frame. And uh, he cites Brand, and these are ones that I would uh, concur with. Uh, these include the existence of fossils with characteristics that appear to be intermediate between recognized groups of species. Uh, however, some of these forms may have been part of the original creation, so you have to be, uh, these are not proofs. These are things that make us uncomfortable. The existence of an overall fossil sequence and even some sequences within certain groups of organisms. Um, uh, the number of fossil families with living representation which increases as one moves upward through the geologic column. If we were to discover trilobites, for example, or if we were to discover clearly post-flood di dinosaur bones, it would, uh, it would make us a little more comfortable with uh, what's going on here. Um, the number of fossil families with li living representation and some biogeographic distribution patterns that prove difficult to explain. Now, for three, I will say that there are some exceptions to that, and it is fair when one is noticing the problem to notice the exception, the uh, coelacanth or calicanth um, would be one, fish that uh, lived a long time ago disappeared uh, supposedly some 60 million years ago and one was discovered in uh, living in the waters off Madagascar. And the ginkgo tree, which is thought to be extinct for uh, about 60 million years and then showed up in China. And of course, some of you have seen ginkgos that have been transplanted to the United States. Um, <coughs> In spite of these problems, there is abundant evidence suggesting an alternative view to that of the conventional geology and paleontology as described below, and he's going to go after them. One, geologic, uh, geological and paleontological data demonstrate sediment and fossil accumulation through catastrophic processes. And it didn't used to be thought that that was the case. There is increased recognition among mainstream Earth scientists that many rock strata have formed catastrophically. Until only a few decades ago, the dominant principle for geological interpretation was that of uniformitarianism, the idea that processes in the past occurred at the same rates as they do in the present. However, many have recognized the problems of this influential paradigm and have come to accept the occurrence of many catastrophic events in the geologic past. Examples of catastrophic features include recognition of well-documented mega-flood events Lake Missoula, he cites Baker, the Mediterranean Sea, he cites uh, Garcia Castellanos, uh, the reason for the, the uh, Straits of G Gibraltar are that that's where the Mediterranean Sea, which originally had been dry, got overfilled through the Atlantic Ocean. And then, of course, it went on to the Black Sea later on. Um, the British Channel, I think that should read actually the English Channel, Gooped et al. And by the way, these are in uh, places like Nature and Science. Uh, this is not a uh, minor uh, out of the way publications. Um, the English Channel between England and France was dug by a mega flood event. Now, think about that for a little bit. Where did it come from? Where did it go to? Um, how did uh, it manage to do that without, uh, you know, without ha having sea on both sides and therefore uh, uh, fascinating? Um, and the fact that it took us this long to recognize it shows the, uh, the influence of Lyell 
uh, and I think that one can say the bad influence of Lyell. Recognition of turbidites, and there he cites, cites uh, Brand, Roth, and uh, Shemugan, so there's creationists and uh, non-creationist scientists uh, that can be cited for this. Um, uh, rapid accumulation of ry rhythmites, which used to be thought of as like yearly deposits. Now they're more like daily or uh, maybe even faster. Um, there are layers of sedimentary rock laid down with an obvious periodicity, which would be previously interpreted as, as result of slow multi-year deposition or attributed to yearly seasonal deposition such as varves. And that raises a question whether varves are really varves, of course. Uh, maybe today they are, but maybe in the past they weren't. The inf uh, this is a long sentence, so I had to break it up, also with a lot of references. And he has another one like that, but I'm happy that they're there. The influence of large-scale scale volcanism in rapid burial events, for example, sedimentary accumulation of volcanic ash, and again, he's citing standard literature. Um, the large-scale effects of bolide impacts, and of course the one you hear about the most is the dinosaurs being destroyed by uh, um, uh, the uh, 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 bolide impact in the, uh, in the Yucatan or perhaps another one. Apparently there were several of them at about the, uh, close to the same time. Um, a meteor that hits the Earth, that's just an amazing number of asteroids have hit the Earth and exploded, causing environmental disruption and, dis and destruction of life. One must keep in mind that the fossil record is embedded in rock units possessing these features, showing that the fossils accumulated in catastrophic conditions. Associated with this evidence of rapid geological activity are many non-uniformitarian features, and uh, Baker and Agar give them, such as large-scale sedimentary processes, for example, the Jurassic Morrison Formation and associated rock units, which I think he's been talking about Dakota and a, a number of other ones that are uh, co uh, close to coterminal with the uh, Morrison Formation. Global distribution of marine rocks with extensive strata bearing fossils such as trilobites and ammonites, continent scale patterns of paleocurrents, for example, the Chin Lee Formation. And uh, there he cites Dubiel and Roth. Discontinuities in the stratigraphic records, such as paraffin conformities, uh, their favorite one from Roth. Gaps in the fossil record with no apparent evidence for the amount of time supposedly represented. Um, large, uh, this is another run-on sentence. Large-scale volcanism, for example, the Deccan basalts in India, Columbia River basalts, northwestern U.S., and uh, there he cites another standard uh, source. Uh, global and regional tectonic events, for example, massive mountain uplifting, plate movements, basin subsidence, massive sediment supply for basin basinal infil infilling, and um, uh, then he has bolide <laughs> event impacts. More than 150 structures of possible extra extraterrestrial impact origin since the Precambrian, some of which measure up to 150 to 300 kilometers in diameter. That's um, about 200 miles. And he's a he, uh, rate of in South Africa and Chilexi uh, Chicxulub in Yucatan, Mexico. And I'm sure I butchered that, but. Um, evidence two, fossil preservation and occurrence. The preservation of abundant organisms that remains or evidence of their activities, such as tracks and burrows, is very difficult to explain using present day con uh, processes that is in actualistic terms, particularly when you consider the nature of the fossiliferous deposits. Many features of, of the fossils themselves support catastrophic events or rapid burial processes. A description of these features follows. Abundance of mass mortality events throughout the uh, 
a uh, couple of misprints that I missed uh, throughout the record. Currently, paleontologists recognize that the majority of these deposits form catastrophically. An example of this is massive burial of dinosaur remains. Thousands of bones and complete skeletons have been discovered. In many cases, sediments in which these remains are found contain a significant amount of volcanic material. So these are mass mortality events. And uh, uh, Adventists are adding to that, by the way. We're doing some digs in is it Wyoming, where uh, uh, one of the things we're doing is measuring the exact position of the bones and come to find out the, the bones are sorted with the larger bones on the bottom and the smaller bones on the top, which suggests water sorting. And uh, he gives uh, uh, some citations from the standard literature. A worldwide extinction events, and he gives another citation for that. Throughout the fossil record, there are many, not just the popular big five strata that record the sudden disappearance of numerous taxa. For example, when discussing extinction, we usually refer to popular species like dinosaurs, trilobites, which there are more than 15,000 species of trilobites, um, and ammonites. But in reality, there are hundreds of genera and many more species that not only have become extinct, but most significantly have been preserved while they're going extinct, or before they went extinct. Something that is extremely uncommon in present day conditions. Think about the hundreds of passenger pigeons. They are hundreds of, actually probably hundreds of millions of passenger pigeons and the vast uh, herds of bison that used to roam the American plains all just kind of disappeared and you don't find fossils of them. You have to bury them in special conditions in order to get those fossils. Otherwise the, the dogs and the bugs and whatever else gets to them and eventually they disappear. Exquisite preservation of organisms. Complete articulated skeletons in the position they were to begin with um, have been found as well as preserved soft body parts. For example, whales, baleen, internal organs such as those in the Santana Formation fossilized fish, articulated shells in both clams and ostracodes. The shells are still together, held together by this little uh, soft tissue that decays and the cells eventually flop apart, um, that uh, doesn't take very long for the shells to separate in both clams and ostracodes, which are tiny ship-like crustaceans. These parts would have been decayed rapidly had they been exposed for long on the surface, on land or underwater, as they are at present. All point to rapid burial and or rapid mineralization. And uh, he has a standard site for that. Opisthotic uh, position, uh, posture of many well-preserved articulated vertebrate skeletons. An extreme dorsally hyperextended posture of the spine, like that with the tail sticking out, uh, where the skull and neck are curved over the back and a strong extension of the tail is attributed not to post-mortem processes, but rather death throes in turn, the consequences of unusual chemical changes in the environment, for example, hypoxia, asphyxiation, environmental toxins, that could reasonably be expected in a catastrophic scenario. These creatures drowned, if you like, or at least they died without enough oxygen. And th this is interesting. The site he uh, he uh, the paper he cites is uh, Faux and Padian. Uh, Padian, and interestingly enough, this Padian is Kevin Padian, who is the, uh, he runs a, a museum at Berkeley, and he is also the um, chair for the um, uh, National Center for Science Education, which is fascinating because you know, what he's describing is these things died, and they died in a way that is at least consistent with drowning. And then they got buried before they became so relaxed that it could, uh, uh, that they could uh, 
come back out of that posture. Uh, if you want to know the classic example of that, it's Ar Archaeopteryx itself. Take a look at some of the photos and you'll see that the bird's neck just way hyperextended, the, the back hyperextended, the tail out. Evidence three, appearance and distribution of the fossil remains. Many, oh, by the way, the, um, this is a big deal now. Uh, we were at um, a Drumheller in Canada, and they had you know, displays of dinosaurs all over the place, but one of the things that they had was a display of, of the uh, apisthotnic uh, posture. Uh, that many dinosaurs are found in. And they showed how they were found in that, uh, you know, that's where they're found. So it, even though I don't think everybody re realizes the importance of that, uh, the fact itself is well recognized. Evidence three, appearance and distribution of the fossil remains. Many types of data relating to the first occurrence of a fossil organism or group of organisms and the subsequent distribution of those species in the record support the biblical model well and in turn present problems for an evolutionary interpretation. And he's going to give some of them. The Cambrian explosion. And he cites Roth who points out that the major problems of explaining the origin of 19 different body plans in the phyla of the Cambrian explosion when in the underlying Precambrian and in very close stratigraphic proximity, that's to say it's just right underneath them, there are only three. So you go from one, maybe two, maybe three, and then all of a sudden, 19. Um, the sudden appearance of more than 20 phyla or different types of organisms, uh, some, size, some places will actually claim 32 different ones. But certainly there's a lot of them. Um, poses a major problem for evolutionary theory, which proposed all forms of life came from a single common ancestor. With no real ancestors further down in the geologic record, the evidence supports a polyphyletic origin of life. And uh, he cites Brand for that where the description of the actual pattern found in the fossil record in which the diversity of phyla, major category of organisms, uh, contrary to what one expected in an evolutionary model, is greater at the bottom of the record and decreases upwards in the geologic column. It's almost like it's reverse tree rather than the standard tree. Um, something one would expect in a model of creation including different kinds. In fact, while evolutionary theory proposed the development of life forms uh, from a universal common ancestor, fossil biodiversity uh, trend data in the fossil record depicts precisely the opposite, an inverted tree of life. Several other sudden explosions present in the fossil record, and he cites an article. So this is not Cambrian, although it's the biggest one, is not the only one. Uh, suggests the existence of different lineages with separate origins. The diversity, uh, Mr. Typo there again, we see today may have come from diversification of the originally created kinds through a process of descent with modification, to use Darwinistic terminology. In fact, the biblical record is not incompatible with a eventual evolutionary change such as microevolution and speciation, and uh, he uh, refers us to uh, Leonard Brand's uh, work on that. The sudden appearance of complex body plans and structures. An example of this is the classic complex optical nature of the trilobite compound eye with no simpler eye structures found in the underlying strata. Uh, there are no half trilobites or quarter trilobites or three quarter trilobites or anything like that. They're just there, boom, and that's it. And they all, well, they don't all have eyes, but uh, the ones that do have eyes have very, very good eyes. Way better than, say, those of a dragonfly. The lack of intermediate forms between major phyla groups, which, of course, is implied by the Cambrian explosion itself. Uh, claimed evolutionary links turn out not to be such, even, even for the paleontologists studying these fossils. In other words, it's not only not believable to us, it's not believable to them. In the last few years, several purported evolutionary links have been shown not to be such. For example, 
Archaeopteryx and the Origin of Birds. And uh, he cites uh, uh, Roth discussing this. Uh, the presence of these morphological gaps among higher taxonomic categories actually serves to document the lack of evolutionary continuity. Um, now, <coughs> while I think it's a fair statement that this is what is mostly happening, uh, when we were up at the uh, Burgess Shale, they mentioned that there was a uh, relatively new uh, possible ancestor that had been found to uh, to one of the uh, one, uh, not not twenty. Uh, in the Ediacaran, I believe that's how you pronounce it, uh, fauna, um, that was, was supposed to have some kind of a jaw, uh, crawled along the bottom and ate whatever it could eat, um, and looked somewhat similar. Uh, again, you have to be careful because links that were thought to be pretty good have turned out not to be. So that may not turn out to be a link, but on the other hand, I don't think it's fair to say that all of the evidence is is uh, against the lack of or is for the lack of intermediate uh, forms. Now, it is probably fair to say, as Stephen Jay Gould did, that the rarity of intermediate forms is the trade secret of paleontologists. Uh, the occurrence of a number of successive strata containing alloxanous fossil remains, that is, remains that did not live there but, but were transported into place, deposited catastrophically. For those of you who want to know the Greek, chthon is the Greek for soil or earth, and it's basically it's the idea that, that autochthonous means that it's the same soil, it's your own soil. Alloctonous means it's somebody else's soil. So. If, if something lived and grew there, then it's called autochthonous. If it got washed in, it's alloctonous. And then there's coal, which is fairly called megalochthonous, which means it's really a ways away and a lot of transport. The famous Yellowstone petrified forests are an example where trees that first appeared to be in old in-growth positions turned out to have been transported from elsewhere. So the old model that used to think it grew right there really kind of fell apart. And I think this is really important. For more than 100 years, scientists interpreted these successive layers as a succession of about 48 fossil forests, give or take, depending on who's doing the stratigraphy. A body of data exists now, much of it as the result of research stimulated by biblically shaped geohistorical paradigms that suggests a catastrophe a catastrophic scenario of transported trees and vegetation such as the one documented after the eruption of Mount St. Helens. So this has turned out to be a really good model. And interestingly, he cites the standard literature for this. For a detailed discussion, he says, see Coffin et al. and for a briefer summary, Brand, these results might very well apply to other similar petrified forests, such as one in New Zealand, for example. Uh, and I had somebody do this once and, you know, explain the, you explain the uh, fossil forest and what it used to be like and then what we found since and, and the evidence that these things have been transported in. And I immediately turned around and said, but what about the one in New Zealand? I, I'm going, um, can't you see there might be a relationship between the two? Um, Record of animal activity, the presence of ichnofossils, that is, trace fossils, such as trackways and burrows, larval cases, and reptile and bird eggs. This, is, uh, this data is very valuable. For the development of a depositional model, since it means that throughout the formation of the fossil record, some organisms remained alive and active. And that's important to keep in mind. Even though this data implies that a certain length of time has elapsed, you have to have time to make a burrow, for example. Um, it also suggests that abundant sediment input is needed as well as rapid burial processes because you, if you let it sit for long enough time, what happens is the burrows make up the whole, the whole thing and then you can't distinguish burrow from non-burrow after a while. Um, <coughs> 
In addition, the abundance of some of these remains, for example, thousands of dinosaur tracks and eggs in many different parts of the world, as well as the nature of the sediment in which they are preserved, suggest unusual, possibly stressed, environmental conditions that would correspond to worldwide catastrophic uh, scenario. And Brand uh, discusses the implications of these trace fossils. And he says, well, many of these uh, activities require time, and any model that tries to account for this should should you have that time. The preservation of these remains indicates unusual and catastrophic conditions. A survey of 25 reported fossil patterns and trends in the fossil records have been published. With an evaluation of them in relation to evolutionary and biblical accounts of Earth's history, and uh, is a, a huge long article called by uh, Jim Gibson, which I, he doesn't say it, but it should be up on the net now, so you should be able to to access it. Uh, just do a little work with Google and you should be able to find it. Uh, this study concluded that more research is needed, but by comparing scriptures in the fossil record, a better understanding can be developed from the geologic column. And I think it's a better understanding than one which ignores the biblical record completely. And um, there's a note that discusses the uh, details of that. His conclusion uh, there is broad agreement among Christian earth scientists who trust the biblical account that the general aspect of, and I guess that's my mistype, the fossil record is catastrophic, one of destruction and death. Um, and his note, he quotes Calmer and Curry as saying, almost 20 years ago, Egger suggested, quote, we are beginning to see a somewhat catastrophic picture. It is evident that he has been proven right. In addition, this overall nature of the record might be directly related to the strong imprint of the taphonomic processes that led to the preservation of remains of organisms in the fossil record. What has been termed the taphonomic megabias of the record. That is, it's got a lot more fossils than you think it ought to, and it's probably because it's <laughs> catastrophic. Much data in the fossil record, this is continuing the paragraph, I, didn't have room for the whole note and otherwise, uh, points to dramatically different physical conditions existing in the past and does not support a naturalistic evolutionary history of life on Earth. The sudden appearance of a diversity of complex life forms and the lack of morphological continuity affirms the biblical account of creation of many different kinds of organisms. Although there are still many questions, when the different types of data, that is, from geology and paleontology, among others, are considered, there's significant evidence to support an interpretation of Earth history that is consistent with the biblical record. And that is his finish. Now, my own take, I, I like Biagi's caution about science proving things, because it doesn't. Uh, I like his caution about the misuses of paleontology by creationists. I think we need to be careful. Uh, we say something that's proven wrong, uh, people understandably don't want to listen to us as much anymore. Um, I think he does an excellent job of marshalling most of the evidence from paleontology, and I, I agree with his conclusion. I don't really have any significant criticisms of his chapter. I mean, you can quibble about whether he capitalized the word flood or not, um, it's, and the treatment is somewhat inconsistent, but um, nothing that I would, uh, in fact, I would say his is one of the stronger chapters in the book. And um, with that, I'm going to uh, turn the conversation over to you. Any uh, comments or questions? We have one here and then one up there. Go ahead. What is the principal argument leveled against the uh, so-called living fossils? Well, I, I th uh, from a creationist point of view, of course, it makes perfect sense. Um, you're mostly de doing deep marine stuff at first, very little deep marine stuff at the end. Uh, if something starts out deep marine, like a, a calicanth, and then it 
uh, uh, you finish depositing all the ones that were down below. A few of them survive and remain, and they still swim down in the waters way down deep. It's really not surprising. And in fact, it uh, wouldn't be that surprising to me if somewhere in the Pacific Ocean that hasn't been explored yet, somebody finds a trilobite or two carling around. Uh, but it's a big ocean, and it's a lot of exploration. And I don't know that we'll uh, uh, get there very easily. Uh, I mean, Kalikans and, and ginkgos were thought at one time to be just as extinct as trilobites apparently are. Uh, now, dinosaurs are a little different story, and actually we'll talk about some of them next week. Uh, uh, but um, but the explanation for it, you know, lasting for for uh, hundreds, of hundreds of millions of years, uh, well, <coughs> at least tens of millions of years, um, because they actually what happened to the Kalikans is they tapered off. They started in the um, Paleozoic, early in the Paleozoic. <laughs> I don't think quite the Cambrian, uh, probably Ordovician is Silurian, but I have to look it up. Some and of them then, have been dated to be over 300 million years ago. Well, they, they have been dated 300 million years ago, but then there's some that are 250 and 200, <laughs> and, uh, and you finally taper <coughs> off and finish at about 60 million, is the figure that I <coughs> have seen quoted. The oldest, uh, the, the youngest one in the fossil record is supposed to be 60 million. And then they're gone. Right. And then all of a sudden they appear. Well, I think that the standard argument from the other side would be, well, we weren't depositing deep sea stuff then. Um, that, of course, would be the standard argument that we would make. Um, so, calicants don't prove anything. <coughs> but I think that they do make it a little uncomfortable. Now, to be fair, the lack of trilobites doesn't prove anything, but it, I, I would like to have a sea you know, somewhere where there's hallucinogenia and all of the stuff that grows in the Cambrian. Um, I'd like to see all of those organisms recur. What appears to be on the sea bottom are mostly relations of things that are modern. <coughs> uh, starfish. Um, but, but starfish have been found in... Yes, they have, but see, they're, they're all throughout the fossil record, and everybody knows they weren't extinct. That's right. And, and that's actually, what really happens, uh, you know, what would be interesting is to find <coughs> fossils of those kinds and see how far we can trace them as if we didn't know they existed today and see how many of them quit about 60 million years ago or whatever. Um, it is, it is a problem for creationists that we don't have as many living relatives of Cambrian stuff as we do of, uh, let's say, Jurassic stuff, and not as many of Jurassic stuff as we do of Eocene stuff, and not as many Eocene as we do of, uh, say, Pleistocene. That is a problem. Um, but I don't think it's enough of a problem to where we should just toss uh, our belief system away on the basis of that problem. Um, because, as you know, there are exceptions. Uh, we had a question here. It had to do with pre-flood rocks. Can, do you have any further ideas on that? Or what, how could we determine there were pre... Because I understand, especially... Well, when Ellen White describes the conditions, that it was, you know, the world was just, it was total chaos. So I'm just wondering about that. Um, well, there, there are rocks that are pre-Cambrian. Most people would accept that they're pre-flood. Some of them have traces that have been interpreted as life, although... To be fair, there's some debate about that. Uh, I tend to side with the people who say they probably do have life, uh, evidence of old life and in them. They would not have moved from their original spot? You mean, or um, not? I well, what happens is, 
that the new rocks on, in general are laid down on top of them. Not always. Uh, in the Canadian Shield, the Precambrian rocks have pretty much been scraped clean, uh, mostly by uh, 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 by uh, the ice sheet that was on top of them. Um, but there's some that probably didn't didn't get much deposited on them, <laughs> and that raises the interesting question: is maybe those are the areas that were sources for some of the fossils that are found, you know, say in the Grand Canyon where you find layer upon layer upon layer. They had to come from somewhere. And while the bottom layer, you could say, grew there, if you're making a flood model, the next layer has to be washed in. And the next layer has to be washed in. And in fact, there's some evidence that the bottom layer was washed in. So we don't know for sure. Pardon me? We don't know for sure. Of course, we can't know for sure whether any rocks maintain their original position whenever the uh, that's know, right and of course if you if you believe plate tectonics which I tend to do uh, then they didn't even maintain their original position on the face of the earth so there's been a lot of change and we don't understand most of it uh, Ariel yeah we're, with reference to these uh, living fossils uh, the issue uh, explains I think a little bit the great flexibility of the evolutionary theory uh, we have living fossils that are two billion years old you go look in southern Canada the Gunflint Chert along the Great Lakes region and you can find very good fossils of oscillatoria, which is an algae that looks exactly like modern oscillatoria. Oscillatoria is a little filamentous algae. It's a long filament. It tends to move around and so on. And it looks exactly the same thing. There's been no change for, uh, we're talking about 2,000 million years here. Uh, now, the evolutionists, of course, will say, well, uh, whatever changes the word did not survive, uh, and the environment did not change, and so we have these living fossils. And uh, so no matter what kind of data you come up with, uh, they seem to have an explanation. And I think the one very serious challenge to living, uh, that living fossils poses to, to evolution is uh, the molecular clock that is used so often in these cladograms and so on, determining how old uh, certain fossils uh, evolved from each other, even though they can't find the fossils or they uh, lower down. Uh, and it's true that the molecular eye is different for different uh, parts of the genome and so on and so forth. So it, it's not a, it's not a good clock. Anybody admits to that. But you have to completely eliminate this thing for billions of years in order to get these living fossils. And I think this does challenge evolution to to, to that extent. Now, but, uh, uh, as far as uh, Precambrian fossils, uh, uh, you know, we talked about well, he mentions three phyla before and so on. Uh, <coughs> I don't recall right offhand what those three were, although yeah. I know one of them is sponges. Uh, I think one is echinoderms from those embryos. We've all heard about, maybe oh, you and I maybe have heard about the embryos. But those, and it turns out that just this last week that a paper has come out and said, hey, those embryos, which are supposed to be echinoderms, I think, uh, excuse my memory here, uh, are spores of microorganisms that are not embryos. Here we've been talking about these things for years. They're supposed to be beautifully preserved embryos, pre-Cambrian, very close to the Cambrian, pre-Cambrian embryos, uh, and I think they're echinoderms. And now they're saying, hey, these are not embryos at all. They're spores of microorganisms. Uh, so. 
uh, this uh, is data going in the wrong direction for evolution as far as uh, uh, that particular aspect is con concerned. And so, uh, reference to your Precambrian <laughs> sediments and so on. Uh, we have huge deposits of sedimentary layers that are Precambrian, 50,000 feet of them uh, in uh, Montana and up there you got these, these huge uh, deposits of Precambrian. You got 12,000 feet of them in the Grand Canyon. They're at an angle and so even though the Grand Canyon is only 5,000 feet deep, you can tell, hey, you can see here. 12,000 feet of sediment there from the middle clear to the eastern end, I mean the middle, uh, the main part of the Grand Canyon to the eastern end. You can see these layers at an angle going down and at an angle and so on. Uh, these are, I tend to think, pre-flood and if I don't want to shock you, pre-creation week of an earth that was here before without form and void, water described in Genesis 1, 2 Peter 3, uh, and uh, served as a source, as, as uh, you mentioned, uh, Paul mentioned, uh, a source for sediments during the flood type of thing. But they're, they're essentially free of sediments except for microorganisms that infiltrate all rocks. We got microorganisms four or five kilometers down in, in, in this the present surface of the earth and so on and uh, so those those fossils could be uh, something infiltrated before before during or after the flood so but there's a lot of sediment there that the difference is when you hit the cambrian all of a sudden you've got all these major phyla uh ediacaran stuff uh so close enough you could include it and just into the cambrian very easily but then Below that, generally only microorganisms, and that's a major break in your fossil record there. Very significant and unexplained by evolution. Well, I should note that uh, it is uh, now 1130, and I know some of you have to go, so uh, I'll uh, probably make another comment, and then uh, we'll... Uh, Try to wrap things up pretty quickly. Um, the uh, did my mic just go? No, no, it's not. Um, I I'm reluctant to make too much criticism of evolution as a um, as a theory that's very plastic. And the reason why is because right now creationism is a theory that's fairly plastic too. Um, I think that uh, that is likely to be true whenever we have theories that are not strictly scientific. Uh, theories that, that involve metaphysical assumptions will tend to uh, try to fit whatever data they can. Now, there are a few things I think that uh, would be really difficult um, for evolutionary theory to handle. And one of them is kind of interesting because there are persistent reports. There were some in the Grand Canyon that were kind of, I think, discounted. Um, but there are some persistent reports in Venezuela of uh, Precambrian uh, uh, pollen spores, which are supposed to be really good. And there's some stuff in India that is Cambrian where one sees um, things like oak leaves. Uh, it's just bizarre. And uh, uh, those are the kinds of things that uh, don't get a lot of press nowadays. Where do they get published? Um, well, in India... A uh, guy by the name of Ghosh did a lot of work on it and it got published in the standard Indian literature, but of course, you know, that's long ago and far away and we don't want to hear about it, so <laughs> uh, it just doesn't get a lot of press. Hmm. Has it been English? 
Uh, in Venezuela, of course, uh, you know, some of that will be published in the Spanish literature. And again, uh, the enthusiasts in the English-speaking world will kind of just Pretend. Uh, ignore the idea that it's there. Um, the problem with those, of course, is that as soon as that happens, you get really hot debate over whether this is possible and therefore it must be a fraud and therefore these things must have filtered in. The oak leaves came from the uh, uh, upper layers and got uh, fossilized. Somehow they fell through cracks or something. And of course, you don't, have to, you don't have to show this is the crack they fell through. You just know because you know there cannot be oak trees in the Cambrian that it had to have gone fallen through the cracks and you, you don't even waste your time arguing that you can show this. You just, the mere possibility is good enough to defend your theory. Even though it's only conceivable. And in fact, Darwin started this out. He said, you know, uh, if there were some organism that could not possibly be formed by, or some organ, that could not possibly be formed by s small the steps, mm -hmm. my theory mm -hmm. would absolutely break down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that is a hugely high bar to set. That's to say that <coughs> yes, you could prove me wrong, but you would have to have absolute yeah. knowledge of all of the possible ways it could be uh, done by small steps and know that there was no, uh, no pathway. Well, uh, uh, yeah, hi, that's, that's the whole thing. It's to ju just prove it's impossible argument. You know, it's, it's, yeah, and, and, uh, and that's, that's one of the things that I think we have to get out of <coughs> is stop arguing about proof and start arguing about evidence. Mm -hmm. And I, that's one of the things I appreciate about, appreciate about <coughs> Biagi's uh, article is that he is in fact doing that. He is arguing from evidence, <coughs> not from proof. Uh, I, I would point out uh, when, uh, some of those Indian leaves, some question whether they're Cambrian or not. but. That's another way of getting around it. Well, yeah, yeah but see, to, that's the thing. If they're oak, uh, they can't be Cambrian, so therefore it, uh, that's, that's the other way of, of, of dealing with the problem is to say, well, no, they're not Cambrian <laughs> because they, they have the wrong fossils in it. But the, the, this question of, you know, flexibility, uh, one of the leading arguments that uh, evolutionists use and I think has some validity is that uh, creation is not science because you can't predict what God would do and therefore you can't uh, make predictions and so on. It is, it is not good science. Uh, but and on the basis of that, you can turn around and say, yes, but uh, evolution is also not science because you've got answers for no matter what data you come up with. Uh, one example in the literature is that, uh, well, uh, evolutionists use uh, uh, kin selection altruism to explain when we're nice, and they use survival of the fittest to explain when we're mean. And uh, so no so matter you what... Can go whichever way you want to go. Uh, well, the uh, ants are social creatures. So um, <coughs> um, Dung beetles are pretty much solitary creatures. It just depends on, uh, I guess, which way the environment pushes you. Um, but, uh, but there's no specifics about what kind of environment will push you which way. Evo so evolutionists are very creative thinkers. Well, yeah. But I, I think that this is, this is a really important thing. Um, a theory can die because the predictions it makes are false. A theory can also die the death of a thousand qualifications. To uh, paraphrase, uh, I think it was uh, Antony Flew, who of course paraphrased the old Chinese proverb, the death of a thousand cuts. 
And it can survive when you just provide alternative, alternative explanations. A, at a certain point, a theory stops predicting because it's afraid to. I would like to propose that liberal theology dies precisely that death because there's nothing for which they will stand up for. I would add to this picture, however, that miracles occur sufficiently rarely that science and prediction usually holds up. And that uh, that's where we try and, you know, use science to, to, to explain uh, because we know science works, and we're, we're comfortable with science. Uh, I'm speaking of data, not in interpretations, uh, scientific data. We're comfortable with that and so on, and uh, we pursue that particular uh, line to a certain extent, uh, rationally, and uh, I think it's, th it's the way the universe is. It's usually rational, but that rationality points to us that, hey, there's something beyond us. And on occasion, something else breaks in that's no longer rational. And it's kind of interesting to me that if you look at the biblical record, the reaction of people to it is usually stark terror. The shepherds are minding their business, feeding their flocks, and suddenly this somebody appears out of nowhere and says, you know, there's going to be a Messiah. And they're afraid. Well, yeah, they ought to be afraid. And, 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 and that's, frankly, that fear is a normal human reaction. You know, Gideon's threshing wheat. He's in the wine press where nobody will look. And suddenly, and suddenly somebody shows up. Where did he come from? Who's, you know, what's going on here? And... Um, <laughs> he does things that are kind of a little on the irrational side. You know, uh, well, here, let me, uh, let me get some food for you. Um, you think the guy really needs to eat? No. <laughs> uh, if everything were that way, of course, we'd lose the ability to reason. Well, that's but, right. Uh, and, uh, but, that's, sure. but this is important. I think, I think that the, the fact of that, that, that miracles are, in fact, rare and unpredictable is, is actually part of, the, part of the biblical record. However, I think also it is true that after the miracle is done, the world goes back to, I guess, what you call normal. That is, <coughs> Jesus feeds 5,000 people. They eat. They get satisfied. Some of them put on a little weight. <laughs> you know, um, uh, some of them that needed to put on a little weight and some of them that, well, maybe didn't need to put on a little weight. Uh, it's, this is what happens when you do miracles is that nature just takes them in stride and starts moving right along. No problem. Uh, and, you know, if we were modern scientists, I think we could probably try to analyze the fish and try to find out whether all the DNA came from two different specimens or something like that. I mean, it's science, uh, miracles do not ruin science. They just add an extra element that you have to deal with. Dr. Geem, what, how would you define miracles? Something that we cannot explain? Something that defies the usually understood laws of science. So as soon as we can explain it, people treat it like, well, that's not, that wasn't really a miracle. Um, kind of, happened. yeah. Um, <clears throat> let me take you, uh, give you an illustration. The guy brings his son to Jesus. He gets thrown in the fire, and he gets thrown in the water, and, you know, it just seizes him whenever, and, you know, can you chase it out? Jesus doesn't argue, well, this is really epilepsy. He just heals the guy, the, the son. Um, 
you could say if you wanted to. Well, he didn't really heal him. He just said the word at the end of the seizure, and it stopped. Of course, if the kid had a seizure the next day, it wouldn't be nearly as impressive. But if the kid had freedom for seizures for, let's say, 10 years, uh, long after the incident had been written, um, maybe f not forever, then at that point you'd start saying, well, you know, this is a bit on the unusual side. Because you usually can't stop seizures without specific medication, and there's no record of Jesus giving the kid Dilantin or Kepra or whatever. Um, but we don't know that it wasn't devil possession. We sure. don't. We don't. The and devil the fact of the matter is we might be mistaking devil possession for seizures, although I'm, I don't quite understand how a Dilantin chases the devil out of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and when they have seizures, there's certain electrical activity in their brain that you would not usually expect from devil possession. Um, we'll have to d define devil possession in an entirely different way if we're going to try to maintain that that is, in fact, uh, demon possession. Well, of course, the devil can simulate well, yeah. In fact, Diseases. people can simulate seizures, and pseudo seizures are a real pain in the neck to deal with. Um, and maybe J Jesus knew that this was really pseudo seizures, and the, the kid was devil possessed and was being told to do this kind of stuff. And that's why he'd su survived so long, is because um, he'd had enough control that it never actually happened when nobody could save him. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there are all kinds of questions that you can raise on, uh, over that issue. But uh, my point is primarily that, um, that just simply transferring it from demon possession to seizures doesn't really solve the problem of what Jesus did. It's still not uh, according to the laws that we know of. Now, are there other laws? Well, possibly, and there's one other th factor too, and that is that implicit in this idea of the laws we know of is that they are not affected by people's mental states. That is, science does not, is not usually conceived of as having to do with you know, whether we believe or not. That's the whole point is that you can be a skeptic and you look at it and say, you know, Something happened there, and it was within this range, you know. Um, and uh, that can happen regardless of whether you're a believer or not. Uh, but there may be laws that depend partly on our belief states or lack of them. The electron. Uh, yeah, or it's observation interesting. It's interesting. Our observations do force electrons to choose, and they do force electrons not to go through two slits at the same time. And the observations, are, it's bizarre. You can make the observations after the electron has been launched from whatever platform, in some cases millions of years ago, at least according to the standard uh, uh, cosmology. Um, Certainly, uh, certainly thousands of years ago, uh, at a bare minimum. So, uh, it's it, you know, miracles in science get dicey. Science without miracles starts to stretch itself in all kinds of weird ways in order to try to account for the data. And uh, you just you have to choose, uh, you know, which one seems to be the more logical way of explaining the data. I don't have problems with miracles and I don't have problems with science. To me, uh, miracles are kind of similar to, you know, when kids are playing in a room and then a parent enters and intervenes in some way and then leaves. The, the, the parent doesn't negate what the kids were doing and the kids don't cancel the parent out. Uh, you see, it, it's just uh, uh, 
acting uh, on a different level, and neither one is more or less real. And uh, as we grow um, more in understanding, we will realize that what God is doing is no less real or, or scientifically amenable uh, than anything that we've been doing, it's just that our understanding of it has been rather limited. Well, yeah. In that sense, in a certain way, humans can create miracles every day. We make things happen that they wouldn't happen otherwise. That's right. Including, for example, this morning I um, got into a hunk of metal and and uh, <laughs> drove <laughs> and and drove here, <laughs> and and that just doesn't happen in nature without <laughs> human intervention. <laughs> <laughs> I drove on a flat pavement that doesn't happen in nature without human intervention. Exactly. You know, uh, you know I mean, uh, granted there are stretches of desert where there's hard rock, but uh, nothing with the directional component that, that, uh, that uh, the uh, asphalt uh, has. Not in such an organized way. Yeah. So... Uh, Again, uh, I, the, the fitting of miracle in with science is not, I don't think, the real problem. Uh, I, th I think the real problem is that miracles and our ability to precisely predict what's going on. But what's, I think, not recognized is that we don't have that precise ability anyway. Right. Um, quantum mechanics says that beyond a certain limit, we will never have, ever, that ability. And, um, and evolutionary theory winds up qualifying itself enough that it becomes, in a certain sense, non-science because uh, if you ask, well, is this organism going to be social or not, you have no clue. Is this organism going to be... Uh, uh, you know, have what this for food or that for food or something else. Well, obviously, it's not going to have food that it doesn't live with. But beyond that, that isn't really much of saying anything. And furthermore, <laughs> as we have found out, if you put it someplace where there is food that it didn't used to have, it will oftentimes find that that stuff is pretty good. All you have to do is ask the uh, Australians about rabbits. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, uh, evolutionary theory is a very poor predictor. Now, I think that there are a few predictions that it does make. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see whether those predictions will hold up or not. Uh, but I anticipate that if they don't hold up, that evolution will be plastic enough to somehow absorb them after all. Uh, and that's why this isn't about proof. It's about evidence. Okay, now on that thought, now that you mentioned that point, I would have thought that organisms that have the shortest uh, generation time would have the best chance to develop evolutionarily yes. in a given space of time. Yes. So what evidence do we have to show that, say, bacteria have that capacity? Well, it's interesting. According to the standard model, bacteria started 3.8 billion years ago or something like that. Um, and they cooked along without change, without change, without change, without change. You get to the Ediacaran, and suddenly there's a bunch of change. You get to a Cambrian, and phoom, there's a whole bunch of change. You get to... Um, there's a mammal explosion, there's a bird explosion, there's a reptile explosion, there's... A, uh, it seems to be that that's the pattern you get, and it's just. But the it, bacteria it, are it, still it, it should us. make evolutionists uncomfortable, and I think it does make some of them uncomfortable, and that's why Eldridge and Gould came out with their proposal of punctuated equilibrium, and that's why it became popular once it was put out, is because in fact they do feel stress, although they were busy denying that there was any stress. And that is perhaps is a lesson to us. We need to admit when we have stress in our theory. We will not grow otherwise. They state that uh, you know, these things did 
change and the evidence are the advanced organisms. They're supposed to have come from those. According to their theory, uh, they did change. Well, according uh, to their theory, you have stasis for long periods of time and then you have sudden, uh, sudden evolution. Now, why it happens at that particular time is not clear. Uh, and, and so it's still a partly a face-saving measure. But uh, the fact that we have so many more microorganisms than advanced organisms suggests that uh, the scenario is not change. The scenario is stasis. Well, the fact of the matter is that we don't really understand how you get from one organism to another. We certainly don't understand how you get from non-life to life. And uh, uh, hypothesis of a uh, intelligent designer is still as good as anything else that's out there. The, the fact of the matter is what they mostly want to do is to keep that off the table because they know if it's on the table, it will clean house because anything else is just pitifully inadequate for life in particular, but even for moving from one organism to another. The, the standard theory says that there has to be twice as much time for this gradual event as, as what it's given. Uh, well, that's not, actually it's not fair. It's hundreds of times as much time, but it's, it's like, they figured that the ancestors must have been around for since about 800 plus million years ago. 896 is the one that is value I've seen quoted the most. Well, they, uh, they, that they, that they, you they, gradually, you have proto, uh, proto uh, chordates and proto um, uh, trilobites and proto starfish and proto well, whatever. Some of them go back a, a billion years and they're, they're because of the molecular clock is so yeah. slow. Yeah, um, so and, and where are these organisms and why are they not buried and, and preserved? Yeah, they're not there. <laughs>